Hi, so um, tracking censorship and surveillance has been increasing around the world, so we've been quite busy. Um, each of us is going to talk about a different area of TOR, our little slice of the onion. So Allison will talk about community and UX, George and, and uh, David will talk about the network, and Matt will talk about the applications. So first, I'm gonna start by talking about what is TOR and some um, louder. So first, so first I'm gonna start, of us, start us off by talking about TOR um, and some news from the organization and communications. And then we'll each talk about our little slice of the onion. So what is TOR? When we say TOR, it means a lot of different things. So TOR is a nonprofit organization that based, is based out of Seattle. It's a community of volunteers and contributors around the world. It's free and open source software for privacy and freedom online. And we believe everyone should have access, private access, to an open web. So at the backbone of all of our software is the Tor network. The Tor network is a network of volunteer-run servers around the world. We call these relays. So when you use Tor, your traffic is relayed through these servers and encrypted three times along the way. So the easiest way to use Tor is Tor Browser. So Tor Browser is built from Firefox with some extra privacy and security patches added. It protects you from tracking, surveillance, and censorship. So if you're in a country where there are uh, blocked sites, then you can access those using Tor Browser. Um, it obscures your IP address prevents network observation, prevents location determination, blocks fingerprinting, prevents cross-site correlation, blocks cookies and scripts, doesn't write anything to disk, and there's no browser history. So its protections are quite comprehensive. The Tor network can also be used to publish with privacy, and we call these onion services. So with onion services, the traffic never leaves the network. Um, you meet at rendezvous, po rendezvous points over the network. It's end-to-end -end encrypted, even without HTTPS. And Onion services can be used for secure and private communications, file sharing, securing IoT devices, and configuring websites in these end-to-end uh, .onion. So Onion services are used in uh, GlobalLeaks, which is a whistleblowing platform, secure drop for secure communication between journalists and their sources, um, and Onion Share, which is uh, secure and anonymous file sharing. So these are just a few examples of how Onion services can be used. There are a couple of mainstream sites now that have, or more than a couple, that have .onion addresses. You can visit the New York Times, ProPublica, Privacy International, Facebook, and you can visit all these sites on the dark web. We have a campaign right now to onionize the web. So we want to demystify onion services. We think these, these sites provide the privacy and security that, that people should be demanding right now. So um, if you have the ability to set up an onion site, we encourage you to do so. If you know of a news organization or a nonprofit organization that would benefit from this uh, censorship resistant site, we hope that you'll help them uh, set one up. And what else can you do to stay involved? Uh, you can follow us on social media. As part of my work on the communications team, we've been having, uh, we've been strengthening our identity across platforms and having more regular, uh, frequent communications. You can also sign up for our newsletter, newsletter.torproject.org. Set up an Onion site, share your story, and uh, please visit our booth. We're running out of teas and stickers pretty fast, so we hope you'll come by. And if we don't get to your question today, you can visit us there too. Um, and finally, you can also congratulate our incoming executive director, Isabella Bagueros. She's probably in the room. Um, so if you see her, say hi. She's a longtime tour project manager. She's done unprecedented work with uh, collaborative road mapping in the organization. She's led usability initiatives in the UX team. And so because of all the work that she's done, and the growth of the organization. We're actually hiring two project manager positions. So um, we're looking for a project manager that can help with network projects and for a project manager with product experience. So if you have any experience or know anyone that does, 
please refer them to our website. Now let's hear what the other teams are up to. Hey everybody, my name is Allison and I am the community team lead and I also work pretty closely with the UX team. So some of the things that I think are most exciting about working on Tor right now is that we're focusing a lot on making Tor work better for real human beings, um, both uh, in the usability sense of, of the word and also in the community building sense. So our two teams work really closely together. We work on things like um, uh, supporting relay operators, um, providing support for Tor users, organizing Tor events, doing user testing, um, translation and localization. And I want to tell you about a couple of the projects that we have right now that I think are particularly exciting. I'm not even really using these. I'm just going to skip ahead. Um, one thing we're doing is we're redesigning our whole website with uh, new users in mind. So we have um, a lot of things that we're working on to make the website itself um, a lot more easy to use and navigate. Um, we're improving our documentation, um, improving our downloads page, uh, and, and focusing on better translation and localization. We are building a few uh, specific portals for um, different types of people who we uh, who either use or work on tour. So one that we have um, in testing right now is uh, support.torproject.org. Um, it's basically a one-stop shop for people who use Tor who might need a little bit of help understanding it. Um, it has a searchable Q&A. It has Tor manuals. Um, it has um, a Tor glossary with definitions. And we're working on uh, developing that right now. And so that's like a really good way to get involved, um, especially <coughs> if you have uh, experience with localization or translation because we want to put it into our top 12 um, tier one languages. Um, we're also building a dev portal for all things development related to Tor, so getting involved with the, with the dev side of things um, and also with research. Um, that's going to be at dev.torproject.org. And then finally, um, we're making community.torproject.org, which is going to be information about outreach um, for uh, Tor trainers, for members of civil society organizations that um, want to use uh, Tor and teach others about it, um, user testing, information about getting involved with translation, and then other ways to get involved with the two teams, community and UX. Um, we are working on a number of things to make Tor not only more usable around the world, but get more people from all over the world uh, using and hacking on it. So we've been doing this by connecting with community members in places where we have historically not been so great at connecting with our community. So, so far, some of the places that we've gone to do uh, user testing and work with civil society organizations include Uganda, uh, Colombia, Brazil, um, this month we're going to Kenya. Um, in the coming months, we will go to Indonesia and India. And the kind of work that we're doing there is we're meeting with the, the kinds of people that um, need TOR, that uh, TOR fits into their threat model. So environmental activists, um, uh, feminist activists, gender-based violence um, activists, um, you know, digital security people too. Um, basically, all kinds of people that are, are making uh, more justice in the world. Um, and to that end, we have um, some new roles in the TOR project that are, that are supporting this work. So we have a new full-time community liaison who's basically going around the world working with, with folks like that. Um, we have a new uh, relay advocate. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second. We have a new translation coordinator, uh, a new user research coordinator, and we're really excited that we've been working with Outreachy for the last two rounds. Um, so that's been really cool too because they bring people into free software um, that historically have um, not had so much of a presence. So our, um, another thing that we're doing in terms of building community is running tour meetups. So kind of related to the community building work that we're doing around user testing and usability, we're holding meetups for people who are interested in learning about using Tor or hacking on it or who have been um, people who run relays or who are interested in it. Some of the places that we have had these IRL meetups are um, Portugal, India, Brazil, Greece, uh, the US, and Germany. And we're holding more of those all the time. So that's a really good way to get involved with the community team and meet other uh, interested tour people in real life. And um, we're doing a lot more to support our global network of relay operators. So the relays basically make up the backbone of the Tor network. Without relays, you don't have Tor. Um, 
And so we want to provide uh, better support for the folks who, um, who make TOR happen. So we have a new person who is full-time, who his entire job is basically um, making sure the relay operators are happy or running meetups. We have this really awesome new uh, relay operators guide that's a lot more comprehensive, and um, you can learn more about that at our table. We have some flyers with information about it. It's translated into uh, to, it's in English, Spanish, uh, and and Brazilian Portuguese. And um, uh, the last thing that I'll say that we're that we're working on on those teams is something called the Library Freedom Institute. Um, we've at Tor we've been working with librarians for a while because they are pretty fierce defenders of privacy and we got um, a grant to build a training program that's about six months long to teach librarians um, mostly in the United States but it's all open source and it's going to get translated about free software and surveillance and um, oh I'm like way ahead of <laughs> I'm just talking. Um, teaching them about free software and surveillance and threat modeling so that they can bring uh, these strategies and tools directly into their local communities. Here, I'll skip nice. ahead where we are. Hold on a second. <laughs> Yay, we have. Maybe. There's, uh, there's where I'm at now. Um, so yeah, it's a pretty exciting project. And like I said, it's all, um, it's all open source. And so you can follow our progress at libraryfreedom.chat. Um, and there's a link to our GitHub repo with all the resources that we're creating. And then finally, uh, if you are interested in getting involved with the community and UX teams, you can find us on uh, IRC, on the OFTC network. Um, uh, the, the different rooms are listed up there. You can also come stop by the table and talk to me about it. Our mailing list, UX at list.tor project, uh, tour community team at list.tor project. Uh, and then lastly, our wiki has a lot of information about the team and different projects we're working on um, and how you can get involved. Yeah, I can, I can advance over here. This is now, we don't, we don't need that. We have too many laptops. Yeah, can you need that one? That's fine. Yeah, I, can, I, can, I can advance if you want, because this is the one. Okay. All right, so um, we, uh, me and George here on the table, we are from the network team. So in Tor we have many teams, uh, and the network team is the one that is responsible for the entire Tor network and the Tor software. So uh, see it as every byte that touches the network, the network team is involved. Um, just a quick overview, uh, basically right now we have around seven full-time developers working on the Tor software, which is the core Tor software. Uh, and I put it in 10 very active contributors. We have more contributors than that, but we have 10 very, uh, very, very active. We have con constant patch from them uh, every week, and they are volunteers around the world. We have people in Spain, in uh, Thailand, uh, and different other places. Uh, it's, it's really well, well spreaded around the world. So as I said, we're responsible for everything. Uh, we maintain a software called Tor and the architecture of the network. So since the last Onion report two years ago at OPE, uh, we, it's, it's been two years, we've been doing many, many, many things. And if you may also recall, we also had an Onion service talk about the version three, next generation. So this is a big, big part of, uh, of what's going on in Tor is the hidden service version three. So those big Onion address are actually a thing now. It's been released. And the only way, the, uh, the only thing you have to do to enable it is to add this purple line in version, in service version three. Uh, we won't go into details, but one of the important part you have to, uh, to, to, to keep in mind is that in the next years or so, maybe one or two years, we're going to deprecate the version two. And the version two is the one that everyone knows, the 16 characters onion address. So if you're running on, uh, onion services, please move to this more awesome thing. Uh, quickly, so also another thing we added is NetFlow padding. Um, it is kind of a complicated thing. I won't go into details again, but the gist, the gist, gist is uh, um, client to relay. When you enter the network as a Tor browser, as a client, you enter to the relay at a guard level, what we call an entry point, the guard, and we create, we have this adaptive padding uh, between the client and the relay, which basically is trying to. Uh, uh, protect again to global observer at this at this uh, layer when you enter the network, uh, and we call it NetFlow because it is um, specialized at uh, going around the NetFlows on the the core routers of uh, internet providers or uh, hosting, hosting providers. Uh, another very interesting thing is uh, we oh yes, 
we uh, started uh, using Rust uh, in Tor. So it's experimental, and by experimental we mean that we... Um, <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> uh, we uh, re-implemented a um, very specific subsystem in Tor in Rust to see how it goes, how we work with this, how we can deploy it. Uh, in, uh, in Tor runs on any <coughs> architecture. Uh, Tor browsers, uh, of course, the, the humongous use case. Uh, so we're working towards having more things in Rust uh, in Tor, as, and it ties in with another uh, um, um, slide we have that George can present, so I won't go into details there. Uh, so this part is extremely technical again, but if you're interested, uh, you can come see us at the table downstairs or after the talk. So we added, this is a very, very nice example of research, uh, uh, academic research going into a production uh, KISS, so the kernel informed socket transport, so all the cells, so basically Tor exchange data between relays and we call those uh, packet data cell. Uh, and we had added this, uh, way better scheduler that allows us to have uh, better congestion control over all the relays, which are you know, 6,500 relays around the, the, the internet. Uh, so yeah, this is very nice, and uh, I think the next part is going to be George now. So another thing we've been doing is we've been trying to improve the experience of people using Tor on the mobile down to the Tor core layer and not on the browser side. So we've been trying to make Tor consume less CPU and less, uh, and less resources in general to improve battery life, as well as we've been improving the interface through which applications integrate with Tor. So instead of like having to spawn your own Tor as a, as a mobile application, you can now use it as a library, basically. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty good uh, approach for the future since everything is going to be mobile. Um, also, if you've been uh, noticing what's going on on the internet lately, on December, we've been, uh, we've been under attack uh, uh, through some denial of service situation through which like, people are using our network to fight with each other or we don't know exactly what's going on because it's an anonymity network. <laughs> but basically... <laughs> But like basically, the performance has had degraded back in December because like t tons of circuits were running around and like causing trouble and like even like normal clients would make more circuits and they would get dropped and they would make more and like chaos was happening. So we had to step in and like introduce a denial of service submodule, which basically like tries to it, it is built on the relays and it tries to like impose some limits on what clients can do. So if, like, if you're a client and you're making like 20,000 circuits a second, we cut you off, you know? <laughs> and this has uh, improved the, the situation considerably, and now performance is back to our good old uh, selves. Uh, another thing we've been doing is that uh, we've been improving the code base so that it's uh, now a bit more tidy and a bit nicer to like uh, navigate through. We've been like uh, like uh, from the ba from the previous directory structure, we've been moving to a more modern one. Like uh, you can check it out; it's uh, it's nicer now. And. Um, so another thing I want to tell you about is that uh, we've been doing lots of work in improving security for uh, guard nodes, which is the first node that you visit as a Tor client, and it's super important for your security. And we've been thinking a lot on how to improve the security we offer there. Uh, we've been improving the algorithms. We've been doing research on how it works. Today, actually, we published a blog post that is um, presenting an add-on that you can use on your Onion service, and it makes it uh, less vulnerable and more secure against certain super like advanced attacks that we've been thinking about. And uh, we made it as an add-on, like a Python application that like interacts with Tor over the control port so that you can test it out and let us know how it works. Check out our blog. Uh, you can see a blog post about uh, this thing. It's called Vanguards. Uh, that's it from the network team. Now uh, on the browser side. <laughs> Hi. Mm -hmm. right. I'm Matt. Uh, I work on the applications team. Um, when people think about Tor, they generally don't think about the application layer. They generally think about the network le layer. And many people wonder exactly why Tor is even touching applications and, and what use cases actually has. And it's important to really think about 
how Tor works and what we're trying to accomplish. So the Tor team, the, the, the application team, has uh, about 11 uh, main active contributors, but we have another dozen or so anonymous contributors online um, and who interact through, our, through, through the bug system. And the current state of a lot of applications is that if you were to basically hook up that application to the, a local Tor proxy and then just send all, send all that traffic through, it basically will give you location privacy, but it won't give you any of the additional identif uh, identification uh, anonymity. And this is really what we try to accomplish with at the application layer, where um, there are basically two uh, main supported applications. One is called Tor Birdie, which is a plugin to Thunderbird. Um, and this is basically a volunteer project, uh, which allows you to connect uh, over Tor using Thunderbird for your mail. But the main supported uh, application is uh, Tor Browser. And this is, um, this is really kind of the state of the art in terms of providing an application that actually respects the user's privacy and doesn't leak identifying information, or when it does, it's by the user's choice. And the user has the power to basically wash away all of the information that has been given away and start fresh. And so over the last couple of years, Tor Browser has been adding in new features and the most recent um, highlight that we're really happy about is that we're uh, releasing a new version of Tor Browser based on the most recent uh, release of Firefox ESR 60. And as Steph mentioned earlier, Fire, uh, Tor Browser is based on Firefox. We, we take the, the Firefox code, we have a separate set of patches on top of Firefox which provide these uh, site isolation and uh, minimize uh, writing to disk and dozens of other uh, features. And it's, it's really exciting to see the progress of this because Mozilla has been extremely supportive in uh, what patches they are actually accepting up, upstream. And ESR60 the, the, the vanilla Mozilla release actually incorporates numerous of our patches that th they've accepted and are releasing to the public. So it's not just the hundreds of thousands or you know, small millions of, of, of Tor browser users, it's the tens of millions of, of Mozilla users that are actually going to be benefiting from this. And as more patches are upstreamed, we're very excited to get to a state where we hopefully won't actually be maintaining our own browser and everyone will just benefit from a, a private browser mode that actually is a private browser mode. And with that, we're, it, other browsers have actually started to see the benefit of this and we're eagerly watching what Brave and uh, Clicks are, are are starting to provide and, and are, are thinking about integrating in, into their own browsers. And hopefully we'll see this trend where all web browsers actually provide a private browsing mode that respects the user's privacy. So in addition, over the last couple of years, we've been working on the actual usability of Tor Browser because it's not just a private browser mode where you open Firefox and you open a private browser and it's easy to use because Tor has, with its added features, it has a bit of added complexity. So we've been trying to provide a user interface that is something that the user understands what's happening, or at least has some view into what's happening. And so we've uh, we created a, a new circuit display. So when you actually go to a circuit, in this case, this is an, an Onion service to the New York Times, and we show the, 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 the three hops on the user side, but because it's an onion service, we don't know what the other hops are on, on for the uh, onion service side. So we basically just have relay placeholders in this case. But uh, with Tor Browser, it's the, 
it, it, it's, it's important to, to remember that uh, usability is one of the most important features that we can provide. Because if Tor Browser isn't usable, then no one's going to use it. So in addition, we also um, we added within the URL bar that when a user is connecting to an Onion service, there's actually an indicator that um, along with a lock icon, where basically everyone is familiar with when you go to an HTTPS website, that if you have a lock icon, it's, we're teaching people that that's okay. And so in that same vein, we're adding an Onion to, as an indicator that visiting an Onion site is actually okay. It's actually a secure connection end to end. And it's something that shouldn't be scary. Even if it's just HTTP without TLS on top, then uh, the Onion connection itself is authenticated and encrypted and is in many cases better than what TLS can provide. And so with this, uh, with this going back to the, the uh, talking about mobile and how mobile is actually a very important platform for everyone around the world. And with what George talked about, about providing better mobile support for, for Tor, we're actually really happy and extremely excited to be able to, to say that we're actually officially developing a Tor browser for Android. Historically, uh, one, one of our very close par partners, the Guardian Project, uh, was working on uh, an app called Orfox. And they put a lot of time and effort and they created an app that was extremely good, but it did not quite have feature parity with Tor Browser on desktop. And so we're finally getting into uh, having full-time developers who are creating that, that feature parity. So uh, these are just some screenshots. Um, but uh, on Android, we'll basically have the same uh, circuit isolation. So when you go to, to two separate websites, they will be separated across two, two separate circuits to pro pro provide two unique identities on the other end. Um, this is something that Orfox hasn't um, provided. Um, and we're basically really excited. Within the next couple of weeks, we should be releasing our first alpha version. And um, we are really looking forward to getting feedback and, and providing a, a browser for Android that actually respects people's privacy and people can be confident that they can use the web without being tracked and without uh, leaking identifying information onto their device. And along with uh, Tor Browser for Android, the Guardian Project has, um, has been helping um, another Tor community member, Mike Tigas, to create what is as close to a Tor browser on iOS as is possible. iOS prov uh, has a lot of restrictions built into it that prevent actually creating a browser that, that has feature parity on iOS compared to Android and, and desktop. But Onion Browser is extremely close, and um, they are... Uh, going to be uh, doing a, a, a push and uh, a, an announcement for the new version of Onion Browser. Okay, cool. So we just heard a whole lot of things from different teams, and now we want to take your questions. So what's the best way to do that here? Are there mics that people stand line up at? And maybe first we can have and a round of applause. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Please, please frame your question in the form of a question with a question mark. Um, and we'd especially love to hear from people who um, are not traditionally represented well in free software, so women, non-binary people, people of color, and people who are not from the US or the EU, or a, a combination of any of those things. So if you're not one of those, of course you're welcome, but you know, let's keep it diverse. All are welcome. Okay. So, uh uh, so as Tor becomes more mainstream and the Tor project moves to try to onionize the whole internet, 
and become an alternative and or complement to TLS. Uh, do messaging terms like hidden, deep, dark have any value or place any longer? Uh, and if they don't, I was just curious if there are plans in place to remove these terms from the Tor, Tor RC files and the uh, Tor project website documentation and public talks. And I only heard the word hidden one time, so you guys did a really good job today. <laughs> uh, thanks, yeah, we uh, have been uh, switching our, our language a bit to, meet, to, to reach new people. There are some definite limitations besides just um, uh, how the messaging might hit your ear regarding hidden and, and dark web. There are a lot of complications, but I think we're never gonna be able to control it all the way, and so there will always be certain people that re refer to the dark web or hidden services, and maybe that's okay. You know, Sometimes you're a hacker, sometimes you're an engineer, and different people talk about it in different ways. Um, so we do prefer that you use onion services and rather than hidden services. I think this will help onionize the web and bring Tor to, to more people, um, but we appreciate you talking about us however you may. In terms of changing hidden services directories. Yes, uh, it, it has been, we're trying to change it to onion service and I think we have a patch in or coming in that's gonna have an ali alias for L, every hidden service uh, option in TORC to onion service. I think that's the best thing we can do in terms of technical things. <laughs> I just want to add one thing re regarding the dark web. We kind of have lost that fight a little bit, but my feeling is that we should just lean all the way into it. Um, the dark web is real. The dark web is cool. Um, the dark web is the future. And when people are like, oh, the dark web is scary, um, our, actually our new executive director has a really great comeback to that, which is, what's the biggest dark web site on the internet? Does anybody know what it is? It's Facebook. So, well, I mean, it is maybe. I know, right? It's weird. Um, so I, I like using the dark web. I want to I wanna take it back. So yeah, if you want to, I mean, keep talking about the dark web and start talking <laughs> about how positive it is. We're starting to lean into it, and together we can make it happen. We can't really see, so just, oh. yes. <laughs> just if, you, if you're up at Hi. the mic and you can just Here. talk. Um, I have a question about the uh, pro third version of the protocol and uh, specifically about the onion addresses. Uh, the 16 character addresses are pretty easy to memorize and just write down, whereas the new addresses are, what, like 64 <laughs> characters? Do you have any uh, suggestions for dealing with that? Like, it's not something you can easily write on a, on a napkin anymore. Um, so I agree with you. <laughs> it is, uh, it is uh, not a step forward in this direction, although I would say that also 16 characters is not something a normal human being can memorize. <laughs> uh, so we were already kind of screwed in this regard, but um, we have uh, serious plans for improving the situation here. We are hoping to get funding to pursue one of the many possible solutions that there are. We've been thinking of like simple solutions like uh, like add-ons into the browser to make it easier to map like normal websites or other TLDs to Onion. We've been thinking of like more complicated stuff like uh, like full-on name systems like um, I don't know like uh, whatever Namecoin, Blockstock, ENS, whatever. Uh, we've been thinking about making our own name system into Tor. We, we've had a few ideas. We are now trying to get funding and like uh, like full-time developers to work on this because we also think it's a pretty huge uh, UX roadblock, basically. Uh, can I ask one more? Th thank you for answering that. Why not? Can you, can you get to the end of the line and let somebody else have okay. a turn? <laughs> thank you. Hi, so I tried out the recent uh, Tor private browsing integration in Brave recently. Um, and I know it's still early, but just kind of curious from your point of view, uh, in the future, if like a browser vendor like Brave fully supports Tor integration in the proper way that preserves all user privacy, is there any reason for a user to use Tor browser instead? Are there certain things that just can't be accomplished unless you have full control of the stack? I think the answer is no. I think if Brave actually provides the same safety guarantees as Tor browser tries to, 
then it comes down to the same argument as to why you choose Chrome over Firefox or you know various other uh, arguments. You know, it, if if both browsers have feature parity, then it's just a, a flame war between <laughs> which browser you choose. I think. Cool. Thanks. Good, af good, good afternoon, or good morning, as the case may be. I came out of a, the earlier presentation on Standing Rock where they mentioned infiltrators, and I remember a while back one of my friends post sending me something about how a basically a police department had set up a tour relay. Have you given any consideration to the kind of measures to make sure that people that are setting up relays are not part of law enforcement or, shall we say, other apparatus of the state? I mean, do you want to talk about like bad yeah. relay stuff? Okay, so so uh, so we have a team, a volunteer tour that uh, does hunt down bad relays, and by bad relays, I mean. Uh, Relays that will hijack net, uh, hijack exit connections. Uh, relays that will RFS onion addresses on the V2, uh, on the version two, uh, and we we reject them from the network. There's 6,500 relays right now. Uh, there was a time that we knew m most of them. 90% of the of the relay operator will come to relay operators at Congress or or uh, OPE or in DEFCON and so on and so forth. So we will meet them. Now it went to a point where we we are much we have more discussion right now in tour to try to uh, control, or not control, I would say, but more of a know who is coming in the network because we have problems, constant problem, like every single week we reject relays from the network and sometimes we reject them and we, we just, we, it's by safety. We, we see 60 relays coming in from Amazon, the same person, the, the same, the same uh, configuration, the same uh, version and so on and so forth. And, and we safe, safely reject them. So I think the goal, the, 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 one of the, the good approach we can take is try to know more really operator, try to be there for the really operator, try to make them feel that they're part of the network. So we're sending them swag, we talk to them, we appreciate them and so on and so forth. So this is why at also we have right now a really Really advocate. Really so advocate. His name is Colin, his, uh, his handle on IRC is full, uh, P-H-O-U-L. So there's a, it's two-sided, right? There's like the technical mitigations and then there's the human side, which is of course no guarantee. Like you can meet somebody and they can tell you that they're not a cop. Um, but <coughs> we think that um, building communities of trust um, and real life relationships is one of the best defenses against um, uh, people who mean to do us harm. Yeah. Uh, oh, no, no go. Yeah. Another thing I'd like to mention is that like uh, on the technical side, the threat model of Tor is already taking into account that some relays are potentially malicious and that's why the path selection and the guard logic and all these things are designed in a way that does not, like if N relays are malicious, it doesn't mean that uh, the, the users get uh, uh, owned, you know, like uh, the, the design is made in such a way that it's in the threat model basically. Yeah. So basically, if they, if some law enforcement wants to run a couple of relays, that's great. I mean, it's just building the network and, and making it uh, faster and, and uh, better, uh, more usable. And hopefully, that means we get more users, which means it's more difficult to actually compromise any you know particular user. So, you know, a couple of relays is probably okay. I mean, if they run half, that's a problem. But we would pretty much know if if any entity or, or group was running more than a couple. Just to be clear, if they d we, we, it's part of the threat model. We assume that they do, and it, and if they do, it still is is doing the minimal amount of harm based on what Tor's threat model is. So, um, if you're a cop, don't run a relay. That's my opinion. So I like your effort uh, towards privacy and unionizing the whole internet. Um, I was wondering, are there classes of applications that you would recommend not including in an onion type network or, to, or the Tor network? So for example, maybe real-time communications, um, VoIP calls, I don't know, do they have bad performance? Any type of app you'd suggest not doing within Tor? <laughs> Torrenting? Torrenting. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, so torrenting is kind of the default application that we don't want for a couple of reasons. One, because it adds a lot of load on the network without really much benefit to anyone except for the person who's downloading stuff. Um, it also, in general, leaks a lot of the local uh, end users' Uh, location information, their IP address and stuff, and so it generally basically doesn't provide that user with the location privacy that they were expecting, so it's actually harmful to them also. Um, in terms of, of other types of applications, uh, I think if the application takes into account that there is added latent latency within the, the connection, so maybe real-time communication will be delayed by a second or two, so you might not want that, but maybe something like a record uh, record audio for, you know, for, for some time and then transmit it and then wait for a record message back or, or something like that. Um, we are hoping that within the next year or so, Tor Browser will support WebRTC, um, and so I think that will be a very interesting experiment to see how real time the Tor network can be in terms of communication. Um, but generally, if the application doesn't leak users' information without their consent, then most applications are OK. And that's, this is basically why Tor has an applications team, because it actually takes a, almost a full team just to audit large applications and make sure that it's actually respecting the user's privacy. But there's obviously a huge amount of potential, so For if sure. you have some ideas, you can definitely you know, try it out and you can let us know. We'd appreciate that. Awesome, thanks. Hi, thanks so much for your work on the Tor project. We all really appreciate it. Uh, I had a question regarding uh, an old project you, you, uh, you guys were supporting. It was the Hardened or Sandbox Tor browser. I felt that was a very compelling project, albeit very hard for usability. Is there any uh, plans or roadmaps to include that in the future? So yes, we're actually having a meeting next uh, Tuesday, uh, 1500 UTC. Uh, <laughs> I know because I scheduled it. And, uh, so we're going to be discussing how we actually revive that project, because that was specifically for Linux um, and specifically for um, users who had recent versions of Linux. Uh, and we are going to be discussing how we actually build that and integrate it into just normal Tor browser uh, in a way that will potentially be upstreamed to Firefox. Um, but also not only Linux specific, but also covering Mac OS X and Windows. So we are discussing it. We don't have a hard plan yet, um, but Hopefully within the next couple of weeks we will. Awesome, thanks. Hi. 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 Thanks for your work. Um, Want to know? Do you have any recommendations for the situation where um, my favorite website doesn't accept Tor connections? Um, so yes. <laughs> uh, honestly, it seems like the best thing to do is get in touch with the website. We actually have um, on, in our new support portal we have some text. Um, about exactly this situation that's like, hey, I'm a Tor user, um, you know, we care about human rights and privacy and freedom online and stuff. Um, you know, maybe you weren't aware. It's very, like, gentle and friendly and, hey, perhaps you didn't know that this was happening or you didn't realize that Tor users are good people and will you please unblock us? Um, we've had some success with that. Um, and I think more hearing from more users um, is certainly, you know, people, they want you to visit their website. So anything that y'all want to add to that? Yeah, like just be, being a human being and getting in touch with other human beings. Thanks. And being nice. Yeah, being nice. <laughs> and not being accusatory and like, well, how dare you do this, you know, because sometimes they don't know. They or don't really. find an open proxy and change it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Forgiveness, not permission. I have a question about the new websites that you're developing. Do they have, a, like, do you test them with JavaScript disabled? Yeah, they all work with JavaScript disabled. That's a great question. Um, for example, the support portal, um, the, if you have JavaScript enabled, um, you can, like, expand the questions. 
Um, if you have JavaScript disabled, it's just a, just continuous text. But it all works without JavaScript. Great, thank you. So you've mentioned, so you've mentioned, and it's been mentioned elsewhere, that client applications that weren't designed to be used with Tor tend to leak the user's identity when used with Tor. Um, are, is it still? Is there still any point in using those applications with Tor, or is it actually more dangerous to use those applications with Tor than without? I think it depends on the application. So Firefox, you absolutely should not use vanilla Firefox with Tor. Um, I think it's just a case-by-case -case basis for basically anything else. Um, there's a, if you're using Linux or, or a Unix-like operating system, there's, uh, there's a program called TorSox, which will basically wrap a program that you launch from the command line and basically pipe all of that traffic through Tor. Um, many people use that for, for example, uh, Torifying their, their mail client or, um, um, or like a, a wget or, you know, just like very simple applications that don't even really have much identifying information or if they do, it's very uh, constrained to what the user already knows that ap application has and, and will give, whether that's you know, just like a, a login um, information or something. But um, I think if you're confident that the application won't leak anything because it doesn't have anything, then that's fine. If it's a more complicated application, then you should be careful. Hello, thank you for your work and your panel. Uh, I was hoping to hear from hopefully everyone at the table for each department. What is your greatest challenge uh, moving forward with Tor? I'm particularly interested in community outreach and bridging that gap into the more uh, mainstream. Um, I think uh, reaching new people and kind of combating uh, a negative perception that people have. But in my experience so far, as long as you can have that conversation, the conversation does go well. So it's just related to community, reaching those new people is a, is a challenge in communication. I, I think, you know, just very similar to what Steph said, uh, there are a lot of people in the world. Uh, they speak many languages and visiting them in, and communicating with them in real time presents its own challenges with things like time zones and, uh, and travel and such. So it's, it's a, it's not an insurmountable challenge, but it certainly is a big task to, if we want everyone in the world to be using Tor, and we do, uh, just making the space to meet who, who those people are, and also uh, getting enough relays to support the network and make it fast and usable for all the new people. And we do just have one, one minute left, so let's uh... um, In terms of uh, network, raising the network and making it scale well, uh, in terms of number of relays and number of users is extremely important to us, as well as like fundamental issues with low latency anonymity that uh, attacks that can happen that we even don't know how to solve exactly. <laughs> uh, so I, I think it's a lot of what Allison and Steph already mentioned, but also on the application side, I think reaching users that don't have desktops. I think mobile is a huge reach in, into that area, and I think um, testing and making sure Tor works on networks that are really shitty, and just like mobile networks in many areas have extremely high latency and packet loss, and making sure Tor is actually usable on those networks is, will be really, really uh, a good step. Right. Thank you very much. If you have any more questions, you can visit us at our booth Steph? or join us on Steph? IRC. Steph, can yeah. I make one quick? Yeah. It's George, disembodied voice. <laughs> George. Um, uh, I was just going to, I wanted to reply real quick, if I may, to the comment about access and Tor being blocked by websites. And then one other quick thing. If, is that all right? Okay. Yeah, one. Anyway. Um, you got 30 seconds. <laughs> Part, part of the problem is that websites are blocking because they don't know what they're doing and they need to be told to stop doing it. 
Unfortunately, there's also those who rely on surveillance and, the, and data collection. So that's a hard argument. The easier argument to make, though, is accessibility. If corporate networks are blocking websites, if countries are blocking websites, that's why they need to allow Tor. And I think that's the technical argument to make that can be convincing. The last thing is Allison mentioned the Tor meetups. We actually have one in New York on August 2nd, where Isabella, the new executive director, will be speaking. Uh, so the, the location isn't totally set yet, but it's probably at NYU Poly for anybody in, uh, in New York. Thank you. He's, a, he's allowed to do a comment because he's part of Tor Project. <laughs> we'll, we'll allow it. Awesome. Good shout out. And thank you, everyone. Thank you to the panel. Next up is Secure Drop in 10 minutes.